I'm Brian Pete. I really sincerely appreciate all of you all taking time out of your, your day. I know there's a lot of things going on in this world and, and in our great city. And um, I'm just really ecstatic to be here and um, looking forward to getting any feedback, any, any ideas to answer any questions, um, any, any challenges that you see that our department, things that we can do better um, to, to serve. And uh, that's, that's what we're ultimately about. And, um, and then again, as I move, uh, move into this, um, hopefully within the next two or so weeks, I know we have a, uh, a city council meeting that's coming up in which the, the, one of the primary topics is going to be discussing the Montpelier Police Department. Um, so I'm in the pro process right now of doing a, an initial assessment on the department. I'm talking to um, external stakeholders that are uh, peers, other agencies, the um, State's attorney, I just spoke to the US attorney, uh, Chris Nolan today, earlier this afternoon, uh, spoke to the FBI and I'm trying to get feedback um, as to what our department's doing well, what our department can use some help on, uh, talking to folks inside our department. And uh, most importantly, I wanna talk to the people in the community and, and find out again, what it is that you expect and want from your department because we're here to serve. And uh, so with that, um, I, open the floor to any, anyone has any questions, comments, complaints, or concerns that they'd like to ask or, or to discuss. We had started listing some questions in the chat area. Okay. So I don't know if you want to address some of those first or if you want to go with conversation. Traffic is one of the things that, that it, that's been mentioned to me several times before. Um, and it's something that we definitely want to, um, uh, to, to address here. So our, our department currently has 17 sworn officers, which includes myself. So for traffic enforcement, we, um, we, we, we need to find ways to be um, proactive when we can so that we're not um, uh, in certain areas. And the other trick to that is, is we want to make sure that we're enforcing traffic in a way that's not punitive to people, um, that we don't want the citizens to feel threatened, but we want to make sure that we have an emphasis on safety. Um, so when we stop folks, we don't know, nobody needs to hear the lecture. Uh, you've been driving too fast, X, Y, Z. It, it should just be more or less the, you know, talking about the education of, of what's going on, um, what we ask people to do and leave it there. We don't need to make sure that we berate people. It's just that we understand sometimes people have they're running late, uh, anything can happen. So, so we wanna, again, our goal here is to, uh, to make sure that we have safety and to do it in a way that's uh, uh, dignified and uh, mutually respectful to everyone. So this is a priority for us. And um, we're gonna have to figure out internally what we can do to try to see if we can come up with a traffic mission, especially without uh, making, even coming close to something of a quota-based system. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Santana. Yes, sir. Hi, it's it's a pleasure to talk to you. I just sent you an email today. Oh, okay. So yeah, so yeah, this is this yeah, this is um. I remember when you brought it up at the city council meeting, and and uh, so uh, thank you very much for that question. You're welcome. And thank you for and, your service. And thank you, sir. I replied to your email. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I just, um, I guess, I don't really have questions. I, I am a, basically a lifetime Montpelier person. I was born and raised here, um, moved away a couple of times, but I'm back here, I've raised both of my children more or less here. Um, one of my children, um, who's now 34, um, had, was diagnosed with autism late in her, in her, learning years and had a lot of, uh, and still has mental health issues and so forth. One thing I found to be very helpful to me was to be able to have conversations with people within the police department so that they were aware of my daughter in the community. We're a small enough community that we can do that, I think. So that if um, she happened to pull a stunt of some sort or she had gotten into any tribe, um, the police department was already aware at some level of the challenge of, of how to approach her or if she had a seizure, how to approach her. And I think that we've had, we've had a couple instances in the last couple of years where we've had people um, who have mental health 
issues, mental health and illness. And um, ultimately they were, they, they died at the hands of the, um, of the police. And so I, I'm really wondering about the, <laughs> when you're talking about the police department, the training on, on, on working with de-escalation and, and uh, so forth, but also connecting with our other community agencies that are more in tune to that, like the mental health screeners, the, um, well, they're the ones I think of immediately, and uh, you know, uh, therapists that might be connected with the police department that can come in in situations like that and help out so that it doesn't end in the death of someone. Well, I, I am a huge proponent of, of, of working um, uh, through this. And uh, so currently what the Montpelier Police Department has is what's called Team 2. So with the Washington County uh, Mental Health Services, with, uh, with Mary, with uh, Gary Gordon, um, they have their mental health screeners. Um, so when, when there are instances in which that we're called to a scene uh, during a mental health crisis, the whole goal is to, so with Team 2 and with the training that we've received as a department, is to make sure that we recognize what we're seeing and that that helps us to de-escalate de -escalate it by, by asking questions and trying to, trying to figure out what do I need to do? What am I going to say that's not going to um, um, overstimulate someone who's going through a, a, a crisis? The last thing that any of us wants to do is when you call the police, you, you've called us at a moment of desperation. And you want us to make sure that we bring, we help your loved one. We don't hurt your loved one. Mm -hmm. And 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 the, so that's the whole goal. So with Team Two training, our officers do have that. Is there's also a state mandate that requires every law enforcement officer within uh, um, Vermont to go through mental health training. Uh, what I've found since I've been here, uh, what, with that being said, uh, in conjunction with the Washington County Mental Health. Uh, Montpelier Police Department, as well as Barry, um, they we've just, I, I believe, as a group effort, I believe they have identified and hired a social worker that will be embedded within the county. So mm -hmm. within Montpelier, within Barry, and this is something that uh, my predecessor had had in the works of that Mary's had um, for the last several months. So um, the city did not, uh, even through COVID, they realized how important this is. And so we made sure, the city made sure that it was, it's a funded program. So somebody I believe has been identified, hired, and now it's just a matter of making sure that we go through all the same mutual training and that we figure out what the, um, what the expectations are in moving forward. Mm -hmm. With um, what I've noticed here, one of the best practices um, uh, within law enforcement and mental health services is CIT. So, which is crisis intervention training. It's based, it's something mm -hmm. that was developed in Memphis uh, and it's a best practice and it's, it's something that uh, 40 hours worth of training. And it's something that um, I want to bring here. I understand that the difficulties here have been because of logistics, um, funding, a whole different issues, a set of issues, but I actually have that training on a USB board and I plan to um, train our officers here in Montpelier and provide that training statewide at, free or for very extremely reduced costs for other agencies. So officers in Montpelier can deal with the crisis. And if you and your family say go to Burlington or you go to um, Stowe or any other place, and hopefully we can get all other law enforcement officers to have this training so that we can recognize what it is that we're seeing and that we're trying to bring, um, uh, trying to deescalate. So I have very robust plans for this and um, and we're not gonna stop till we till we get it right. And, and, and with that being said as well, I think it's incumbent upon us um, to partner with other agencies, schools, social service systems, um, everybody, to make sure that we have dialogue, uh, constructive dialogue, dialogue with one another so we can understand, so we can identify folks and understand and make it sure, make sure that families have the resources they need to get the help before it becomes a crisis situation. And, and that's the whole goal was to make sure it doesn't get to that point. But if it does, we need to make sure we're trained and we're prepared to respond to it, to, to make sure that the people we're trying to help are safe, families are safe, and that we're safe in those responses. Yeah, I think trauma-informed training. I, the, the, trauma is such a deep um, 
seated thing within a lot of the mental health and behavioral stuff that, um, and I know I, I worked with Family Center for many years and that has been our course of training over the last two or three years is trauma-based mm -hmm. um, teaching and working with clients and so forth. So being aware of where trauma can bring out a whole bunch of other stuff. So I'll, I'll yield the floor, so to speak. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much for your question. Um, I saw that uh, Representative Hooper uh, was, uh, had, a, had a question or raised hand. Yeah, hi, Chief Pete. I'm really happy to meet you and thank you for having these forums. I think it's a great way for us to get to know each other. Uh, one of the challenges that we've had in Montpelier with um, responding to mental health related um, issues within the community is just having time to get officers to the academy for training. We had a pretty good record at one point where everybody had the training and then we really kind of slipped. Do you know where we are now in terms of the numbers of, you know, the percent of officers who've had the training and what's the plan for making sure that everybody's getting it? I've, I've been working very closely with Drew Bloom um, up at the Academy since I've been going back and forth. I even got the scars to prove it. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. he, uh, he, is, um, he, he is extremely passionate in, in, as far as the, the, the training, especially with, with, with mental health, is concerned. So I, I believe that the Academy is, I don't want to speak out of turn for him, but I believe they are making sure that all departments stay current with that mandate. But I don't think that they have the funding nor the personnel to 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 be more aggressive um, and more in depth with that mental health training to, to bring it to advance it to the next level. They're doing at, at the minimum, the state minimum and beyond, in my opinion. But I think that they're they're very hungry and eager to take it to the next step. I don't think that they have the resources to yeah. do that. And in light of that, that's where he and I have been having those conversations about trying to establish a CIT program um, that can kind of take some of the stress off them. I, I was wondering about our police department and how oh, many of and, our officers. Oh, and, you know, yeah, each of our. Okay, I apologize about that, ma'am. Each each of our officers are are current and updated with their um with their mandated training for mental health, and then we're going again. We're going to take that up. We're going to kick that up several notches. That's that's really terrific to hear. Um, thank you. And can you just generally, I mean, you're coming from away and looking at us with fresh eyes. Could, what, what do you think we ought to be paying attention to? What kind of pops out to you? Um, I don't know. It's um, what I've seen as far as, as far as Montpelier itself or as far as statewide or both. Well, I tend to think with a statewide hat now, but everybody sitting here is interested in Montpelier. So we should talk about Montpelier. Okay. Well, with Montpelier, I think Montpelier has been doing um, a lot of, it has been doing 21st century policing before it was defined by the task force. And uh, it's, uh, it's, and, and with that, with the evidence-based practices that the task force has done, it's only brought out more, more different, or, specialized way, uh, best practices in how to do things. Um, but I think Montpelier has, in my opinion, has been a national leader. I've had the opportunity to look at, um, to be in several departments. I've had the opportunity to be part of a, a consent a decree monitoring team in Chicago. And, and they're doing everything right here. And in the culture, I think the biggest, to me, the biggest thing is the culture. And, um, when you don't have a culture that, that starts off with the whole bullying aspect, that when you go into the academy and it's a, a raw ready off the top, it's, you know, who are we going to ostracize and, and push away? I don't see that um, as far as law enforcement is here. I see everyone's mutually trying to help each other and, and establish a culture and not being part of of what's ugly about our profession at times. Um, so I'm actually very, um, for the state, I'm extremely impressed at the culture. And for Montpelier, I'm ex extremely grateful and impressed with um, the level of professionalism that I see with the officers and what they expect from themselves and from each other. There's definitely an established culture here and uh, those who don't uh, live up to the high expectations of our city um, are, kind of, are weeded out. 
Um, so, uh, like Liz had mentioned earlier, she has an uh, adult daughter with disabilities. I have an adult son with disabilities. Um, and um, I would certainly, I guess, like to bring him to the police station just to meet people mm -hmm. since there's a whole new crew. He used as a as a child, he um, he knew a lot of the police officers, and now a lot of them are gone. Um, anyway, so I didn't know what you thought about that idea. Um, and then the other thing is, um, the other thing is what? The other thing is, oh, I just <laughs> I don't have a lot of experience interacting with your police department, um, which is a good set. Um, but a couple ago, uh, there was a car accident on East State Street. My, I wasn't in my car, it was parked on the street. Uh, so somebody was coming up the street and somebody was coming down the street and my car kind of got smashed a bit. But the most wonderful thing was, um, <laughs> that every officer that responded was so kind to every different person in that triad. Uh, well, somebody had been drinking and, you know, did the crashing and another person had gotten crashed into and was injured. And then there was me who came out to find out that their car was a little smashed up, but every officer was so kind to to everybody in the situation. I was so impressed with that that the next day I went down to the police station. I wrote a letter to, I guess, the chief at the time, and I just said, and I spelled out what had happened. And I, I don't know. I was. I just wanted to share that because, like I said, I don't have a lot of experience interacting with individual police officers, but that brought a lot of officers. To together and they were super nice and compassionate with everybody involved well i definitely thank you so very much i appreciate that feedback and i'll make sure to send it out to the other officers um uh i, I community outreach and community policing is huge and yeah. it's something that all of our all of our citizens are rightfully demanding from the department and uh, we're looking at different ways that we can make sure that we're out in the community as much as possible so that when you see us, it's not a traffic accident. It's not something unfortunate right. that you see us on the best of days. So, right. that, so when those worst of days, God forbid, happen, <laughs> we have that compassion. We know, okay, it's yeah. Kathy. Kathy's my friend. We've spoken several yeah. times. I have a very strong vested interest to make sure he's safe her family right. safe, her property is safe. And that's what the whole thing is about. So we're working on ways to make sure we establish those bonds. And, and by all means, bring your son down. This station is your station. Anytime, let us know. Um, one of the other things that, we, that we're also looking at doing is doing partnerships with, with places like NAMI, with um, folks who do, the, you know, the national organizations that do specialize in, 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 in autistic or in autism that we look for best practices yeah. and what other places have done. So, so right. one of the things that we know, some folks who, who are autistic, there's a draw to water. So, right. oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so how do we know? So if we do an outreach with folks, you know, with families who are autistic and okay, who's your, what's your daughter, your son's name, where are some places they may like to, um, that they like to visit, yeah. but they wander off from home we can help with those yeah. looks and the first things that we're going to do is you know we're going to go to different places you know like to the rivers and to the dam yeah, all different places to make sure that we do that and, and again some other departments ha do have like identifiers so yeah. um if, if if a child's autistic um and they're higher on that spectrum scale they may have that purple wristband right. and then once the officer gets there they see we know what we're dealing with we're not dealing with right. somebody who is who has malicious intent we're dealing with somebody right currently in crisis. So uh -huh. those are the different things that we want to make sure that we pump up a notch to. Well, that was brilliant. And my son does have autism and I've been an autism specialist for the last 30 years. And um, so- <laughs> You know what, and, 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 and I'm not saying this that hardly, and I, don't, I'm, I apologize, but 
I would love for you to come in and tell us your stories. I'd love, love to. Right. You to come in and give us that training. My, we're and going the, through that. the other thing is my son's black. So, you know, there's just all kinds of experiences <laughs> here. You know, the more <laughs> we speak with each other, the more I think we learn from each other, the more we I learn. agree. We're all I the agree. same and not different. And that's what, <laughs> what we have to do, especially in Montpelier. We have to make yeah. sure that the example for what this job can be. And I think it's nice that you connect in with the agency, you know, different agencies that have this experience, but tapping into the families, the people who live it, that's where, uh, that's where some good information comes from too. So. That's where I learned. That's where I got the, <laughs> honor, the power of the stories of people's experiences. And, um, exactly. and, and it boils down to, I remember, you know, even the first day in Academy when I went to, um, to Fletzy and the first thing was, who do you want showing up when your mom is going through crisis? Do you, yeah. everybody knows that one person who shows up and escalates the situation. Well, now we need to make sure that we, you know, there's no more, um, that we, it's incumbent upon us. It's written in law now that we have to make sure that we deescalate and that, you know, that we do those things when we see those happening within our ranks. Um, yeah. Now it's actually spelled out on law, but but that's the, the the majority, the crux of the people in this profession. We need to make sure we remember that. And again, that community policing aspect of it is getting in with the families yep. and learning and listening, and um, that's what we're we're aiming to do and to continue to do. Well, there's great families with uh, kids with autism in this town, and Liz and I know every one of them. <laughs> <laughs> we're ready. We're ready to learn. Okay. Good. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Gail. Mr. Guayo, or how do I pronounce yes. it, sir? Aguayo, yeah. Hold. Okay, Jose got Aguayo. No, no problem. I just, uh, well, I wanted to tell you, I, I have some background in that. I worked in far west Texas as a crime victims coordinator. I was a part of the border prosecution uh, unit and part of the DA's office. And uh, I did a lot of trainings with the various police forces out there. And I've actually volunteered, I actually offered a while back to be an interpreter and I was called out um, this year in the middle of a snowstorm actually. And we went out with, I went out with some officers. I was really impressed, truly impressed. Uh, they did a very good job. I mean, obviously you can always have improvements in training, but I was very impressed. And uh, so I wanna encourage you to continue when people volunteer and offer to take them up on it and have people, um, especially people don't know this, but we have quite a few uh, people that speak uh, as a first language, uh, you know, some other language. And uh, if you have somebody in the community that's uh, willing and able and has the training or capacity to do so, to, to take them up on it instead of having a phone interpreter working on the case, uh, I think it's it's uh, always good to have a person there. Um, but anyhow, I, I have to say that I was I was impressed. It was, it was a difficult situation, and, and I think that it was handled quite well. Um, and the other thing is I, I wanted to, you mentioned it already, but I want to encourage you, you, you have this uh, coffee with a cop and getting out there. And I think that that's been great. And I think something like that to expand on that idea. I know we, my family have been at these and they're great. Um, you know, it, it just uh, puts a face on the officers, the community and, the, and they meet the local community. So it's great. And I guess one, uh, I, I have my little, my little, uh, uh, complain is that there's always, and I know it's difficult to police it, but the intersection of a uh, of state and Maine, you know, people just, I don't know how we can, maybe there's some examples out there of what can be done to sort of uh, enforce it a little more where people don't just cross in front of vehicles. We've had some people get injured further down on Main Street in the past, and maybe there's a way to uh, improve because I, you know, I don't know how many times I've been going down the hill and suddenly somebody just crosses right there. Uh -huh. And it, you know, it's concerning. I'm gonna end up hurting somebody who's just uh, going across. So thank you so much and uh, welcome to town. No, thank you so very much. Thank you for what you're doing because that that job, especially in Texas, what you did, <laughs> my wife did it in Chicago and, and there were nights that she came home and it was time for me to just shut up and just listen so I can, under, I can, I can understand. Was, I had a, the largest district in West Texas, so it's... <laughs> Yeah, it was pretty brutal. <laughs> I, 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 was, I, was, I was actually the clerk of criminal jurisprudence in the legislature, and I wanted to have a hands-on experience. <laughs> you, you got a real good hands-on experience. <laughs> yeah, more than I it was, it was something else. 
Wow. Well, thank you so much. And, and I will make sure we, we bring this and that again, uh, we know traffic is, is uh, it, it, I'm hearing it repetitively and uh, repeatedly uh, throughout uh, these, these meetings. And uh, it, it'll be something that we make sure that we do our best to, to try to get a handle on. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'd love to ask a question. Yes. Um, thanks for uh, having this. I appreciate it. My name is Meredith. Um, I, I'd like to just bring the, the national conversation into the space and talk a little. I'd love to hear your thoughts about accountability and repair within the context of police work. You know, I'm really, I'm, I'm curious about your thinking on how we move forward on um, really better integrating um, a culture of repair when a police officer does harm, not, not necessarily with intention, but you know, police officers are human. We all work different kinds of jobs. Things happen that shouldn't some, you know, you know, and we all know that profiling is an issue. And I'm just really curious about what your thinking is on what does repair look like when, when harm is done by an officer and, and what accountability really looks like? Um, I think that is, a, that is a very good question. Thank you for that. It's an extraordinarily one. Um, uh, I, I think to me, if I could boil it down to the simplest way that I understand it, to me, repair is righting a wrong that I've done. And um, I, I can think back to relationships in my life that I, um, things that I'm not so proud of that I may have done something that I have uh, just burned bridges with people. And um, so I, I think that um, it's one of those things that whether we did it directly or whether it was done by something in our profession, we as people tend to just say, there is an institutional problem here, or, or you know, we, we need to make sure that first and foremost, we don't paint ourselves or paint each other with the same broad strokes. That being said, the institution of policing has needed a long do. It's just needed work. And, um, and it's to the point now that I think that people who have wanted to come into this job and fix it from the inside out are now, they have power to their voices. Now it's not just, well, that's not the way we do things here. You go over there, we force you out, we make things bad for you, and that's the end of it. It's like, those are the charges that are coming up. And, and, and so, so those people, we have to continue to give them the opportunities to make those types of changes while being cognizant of making sure that we earn that trust and that we're held accountable. Um, so uh, I, I think it's, it's it's going to be getting our butts out there proactively, um, taking every opportunity we can to make sure that every engagement that we that we have with someone is a positive one, is as positive as possible. And anytime that we're called into a situation that's crisis, that it's dignified and it's mutually respectful. Um, but in repairing that, I, I fall back on how hard is it to gain someone's trust once you've broken it. And, uh, and I think that's, that's the challenge to it is to where we are. Um, and that's only done by showing people that you care. And the trick is to actually care. And uh, so with culture, um, our, our, our department or our institution has had a culture that, have you ever heard of a, a have you ever heard of a convert or, or what, what sometimes in our circles is referred to as a warrior geared mentality? And you have this warrior gear mentality. You have to be a warrior, and and you know, and you're the sheep dog, and and society is the sheep, and your job is to protect society from that wolf that's ever present, and this that. I know a lot of sheep that can handle themselves better than I can, so I don't see the population I serve as sheep. I see them as people. I see them as capable people. So when we have to look at our institution as nationwide, as our profession, we have to get out of that mindset. We have to get away from the us versus them because once you do that, you can start, the job is dark enough already, but if you start that way, it's easier to start treating people like crap. It's easier to start being disrespectful to people and it's easy to dehumanize them. And once you do that, things just go downhill from there. 
And that's not what you, any one of us should be doing when we get into this profession. So I'm sorry about that soapbox. I feel extremely passionate about that. But as far as answering your question, I think that, that we have to take the lumps, um, but we, we are also begging for the opportunity to make sure you hold us accountable. But if it's something that our department has, is doing, then by all means, I need to, I need to be smacked up for doing what it is. I'm no pun intended. I need to be, to be dealt with. I need to be held accountable to it. But in the interim, if our department is striving to become better because of the human element that you had mentioned, and we're trying to look at ourselves internally to do reflection, to look at things like implicit bias training and, and, and everything to that fact, it, it's, it's, it's internal. It's knowing yourself, I think, ultimately, when you come into this job, so that it doesn't change you for the worse. So um, I just need that opportunity uh, to show everyone what I'm passionate about and what I'm doing and to be held accountable to those standards. But again, in answering that question, it's just, you know, we have to have those candid conversations with each other. As a chief, when I go to the, the chief's conferences, I have to be able to stand up and speak truth to what it is. This is where we've come from and this is what we're doing. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. We've treat, treated people like crap. And now here's our comeuppance. And it's incumbent upon each of us to do something about it. So we just have to be part of a national trend to move it. Are you seeing um, other departments uh, that are talking about different models for accountability that really are shifting what we have right now? Um, I, I, I think that there have, there have been roadmaps that talk about transparency and accountability, and they've been there for a long time. They've been finalized in 2015. The most recent, which is in uh, President Obama's uh, uh, task force on 21st century policing. So it's, I, I, there is some pushback to that. Some of it's political, some of it's just like, well, this is the way we've always been doing things and nobody who's not a cop is going to tell me who is a cop on how to do my job. Um, so so I, I am seeing um, departments, especially the larger departments, um, that are moving to these directions, but unfortunately there's still some, well, we're doing things the way that we've done them before. And unfortunately that means not necessarily getting out into the community and knowing your community and um, getting out there and, um, and treating people and, 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 and making sure that your culture weeds out those who who just aren't service oriented thank you i appreciate it thank you i'll sit over next to you george can i jump back in yes ma'am yeah so that was a great question Meredith. thank you very much for asking and i think it's on all of our minds um, following up a little bit on that, but kind of looking down at what we're doing in Montpelier, I'm curious if you could talk about how you plan on working with the Community Justice Center, um, center the, the, that we have. Um, I see them as an important part of that relationship with the community and a good way to have the dialogue. I'm not sure they've ever been called in when an officer um, it, it may have had harmed someone and that there's been a dialogue there, but it occurs to me that they, they are excellent at doing that sort of work. But, but just generally, I'm curious how you imagine working with them and if they have enough resources to do the work we ought to be doing in the community. Um, that, I, I've, I've met with them online and I've met with them in person uh, during one of the, um, well, in, in person and, and, uh, and we're slated to have, those, those were more of like introductions and we've, we've kind of uh, grazed the surface on those, but we're, we're about to dump into a deep dive. I think next week I have uh, another appointment to meet with them to speak directly. One of, I think that uh, it, to me, it's a trifecta. It's the, it's the police department, it's the state's attorney's office, and it's the CJC. And a lot of people have made it abundantly clear that uh, in, in some of these cases, and even we agree to that, that law enforcement doesn't need to be um, in the middle of disputes, that we, we should be, we, we should have a, a lane and we should steer more of a lane towards um, de-escalation and, and working on criminal aspects rather than in the disagreements or things that, that don't require us. So uh, it's huge to me. I think that it's, it's something that um, it, it is, 
I guess more normal in this state than I've seen any place else. Every place else talks about it. you got to have a, a restorative justice place, and Montpelier has it. And uh, so I think that by making sure our officers know who's part of the CJC, that um, we know that we're all working towards the same thing and we have those same interactions, that we realize that this is an issue that, hey, I'm not going to we want to make sure this is resolved. I do know the people in the CJC. I do know what their what their capabilities are, capabilities are, what they can do, the success rate that they've enjoyed. Um, so I think w with those relationships, with stronger relationships between us and them, um, that we can become that whole family, and that it will be easier to make sure that we can pass on information back and forth to um, to, to, to promote a restorative justice. I think the police department has been pretty good at working with them and there's been a nice relationship there between the PD and the CJCs. I, we need to um, help the state's attorney see that um, what a great resource it is and to use us. And they're in a transition now. Um, so we, we need to be careful that we build, that we maintain a good service there. Yes, I wholeheartedly agree. And, and, and in talking to Rory, um, the, the state's attorney here for Washington County, he seems very, um, very receptive to making sure that issues are, are you, that the CJC is utilized um, uh, as much as possible. And, um, and even in conjunction when there's something that may be more of a criminal element, um, well, it's all in those cases, but even like the more severe, the more severe the topic, or the incident, he still wants to see some kind of involvement from that. So I'm just going to take that and run as far as I can before that lease chokes me. Well, can I just, since I work at the Justice Center, I just thought I would point out that we do get, um, you know, a lot of people have in their conditions of release, they, they uh, participate in a restorative justice process. So we do work with criminal cases also, and not just neighbor disputes. And, um, we do mediation. So even if it were a police officer in the conflict, um, he or she could come in and use the services of the mediators um, to work on that internal cultural stuff that you were talking about. And we really want a restorative community. So there are practices you can apply everywhere and not just in some particular instance. So. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm in favor of what Mary said. <laughs> and thank you for that, because when we all first met that first time, my impression, my experiences with restorative justice has been, and it's probably coming through in the dialogue, um, which is why I need to get smarter and, and more in-depth and uh, immersed in it, but our processes have been, when there's a, a, a resource like that, it's normally typically been, oh, here's a very low-level misdemeanor, take it and kind of go away rather than what the full capabilities of this is. And if you're looking at restorative justice, to me, it's a multi-layered thing. And right. if you want to reduce recidivism, if you want to, to make sure that people have the resources they need and going forward and that whole thing clicks, what I did, you know, it hurt so many people on different levels, not just myself. I think that um, uh, a CJC is extremely important in that equation. To me, it's, it's that trifecta. Uh, um, of looking at how we can how we can better our community there rather than be punitive to our community. And I, I um, look forward to, I think our new director and I and our reentry person, we'd all want to talk to you about all that we do so you know, because yes. yeah, we could use a nice one-on-one. -on -one. And there are some new officers who haven't, we've talked with a lot of people, Mike Solbrick has worked with, uh, I've worked with a lot of your officers, but um, we could use some, talk with the new people so they know we're there and what we do. I, I am so looking forward to that. But yeah, we, we will make sure we do that. Yeah. I just wanted to say that I would like to introduce my brother, George, here. Hi. Hi, and, George. Uh, <laughs> well, did you want to say something to the chief? Yeah, I got, the, I got a problem, chief. Yes, sir. Well, I was in the back seat officer okay you were in the back seat i was in the back seat uh -huh. my seat belt came off okay yeah it came off oh 
Oh, it did. Yeah, it came up in the back seat. I had to ask it way in the back seat. Was was that when when we were in North Carolina? Yeah, Bobby well, oh. we wasn't looking with a <laughs> stop sign. Mm -hmm. okay. Wow. Yeah, and were you hurt? Hurt, yeah. Yeah, but you were hurt from the seatbelt, right? With the chest. Seat belt. On your chest, yeah. Seat belt. Anyway, that was a scary time for scary. us. That's very true. I'm sorry that happened to you. Are you doing better now? Yeah, mine's yeah. okay. He's all better now. Good. And we got a new car out of yeah. it. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Is that, that, do you want to say welcome to Montpelier? Too? Yeah, welcome to Montpelier, Chief. Thank you so much, sir. I sincerely appreciate it. I look forward I like to, to have a medal from you. Uh, <laughs> or a badge. A medal or a badge will do. Yeah. <laughs> I told Great him to that probably you. wasn't possible, but he likes possible. to make sure, you know, he doesn't want, want to miss out on how parts can be. be. <laughs> I will say that when the COVID thing is over, George gives some of the best hugs. <laughs> I'm I looking know. forward to that. I, I love you too. <laughs> oh dear. I love you, Liz. Uh, I, as, as I'm thinking too, now, George. as I'm thinking now, I'm thinking hopefully when COVID goes over, there's nothing more yep. than I'd love to do right now than throw like the biggest oh. barbecue for this city. Wonderful. Uh, at the state house lawn. So, um, yeah. Oh, I'm nice. Or something like that. <laughs> Well, maybe not at the state house long. We'll find someplace else better, you know. Okay. Well, not better, but you know, someplace else. But uh, I, I think it's. I think oh, yeah. we all need to get away and, and get out and see each other again. Absolutely. Yeah. So, thank you all, all for your comments in the chat. Um, I sincerely appreciate them, and and thanks for the feedback. Are there any other questions? Or um, and it's great to see you guys all again as well. Are there any other questions? Uh, Complaints, concerns, well, challenges, anything that I can bring up. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll have one, and that is uh, discussed with friends. And we've wondered, where, what's your position on officers walking a beat downtown rather than just being in their vehicles? I know there used to be uh, a pretty regular uh, event of officers being on bicycles. And I, I think that that goes some way. Uh, and also wondering if, if there was more of a presence uh, on the, the street, if that would be helpful uh, in dealing with our growing homeless population, uh, and, you know, who sometimes settle into places that are awkward for businesses and awkward for passers-by uh, and just, uh, I guess how in general you approach that that dimension or see that as a as a strategy. Uh, it is um, it, it's a huge strategy for us. The, um, the 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 challenge that we have is just the well the bike patrol. I know that we've been wanting to try to uh, relaunch that, but in light of everything that's been going on with COVID, um, it's been more difficult. But we're trying to figure out creative ways to make sure we get out there and to make sure that we are seen, we're present, especially in the downtown area that we are walking the beat since that's not because it's that's the that's you know the tourists or the or the but that's where we can meet the most people and introduce ourselves to the most people um so we're trying to definitely figure that out but uh, our challenge has come into when we maybe may only have one or two or two or three officers on a shift um we, we're just we're finally up to full strength but if we only have one or two officers on a shift and they're all dealing with calls or they're going from call to call uh then it's an issue on how when we can get back down and walk through but that doesn't mean that we don't try and and that's that's a huge um uh expectation of us right now here and and so we're going to find a way to make sure that happens and um i don't know what that's going to look like just yet um but it is going to happen and 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 we'll figure out a way to to do that and and yes i'm a huge proponent in that um because again people need to see who we are and we need to see who it is that we serve and meet everyone. Oh, it does seem to be a really, really good way to make that contact, a larger contact with the community. Thank you. Yes. All right, thank you. You know what? And I, I mean, if you know, if that means that, and part of the other thing about something like that, uh, it you kind of just gave me an idea. 
Um, I appreciate it, but um, it's it's um, yeah, it it is a it is a community and it is a connection and we just, we have to show that. And, and, and to make sure that that goes as part of a, you know, you've got to have that informal culture and that formal culture, that professional culture. And to make sure that you um, instill a culture that it doesn't go back the other way, it's incumbent upon us to find ways to make sure that this is a professional fit. So in things like um, yearly assessments or you know quarterly assessments or feedback, those types of things, I think that it, it's essential. It's a best practice to say, how many times have you been out in the community? How many times have you gone to the school while you run shift? How many times have you read a book? How many times have you stopped on someone on the street and said hello? How many times have you had those interactions and make those things uh, give those a, a, a higher pointed value system to show that's what we value. So when you're looking for promotion, when you're looking to go off to different training places, when you're looking for internal opportunities, that it's one of those things that we we continue to promote. So we have to make sure we instill that professionally. And, uh, and, and the idea I think you gave me was just like seeing if we can do like a, I don't know, maybe, and that's what I've asked other people in the department to do is what are some creative ways that we can get back out to the community? And I'm thinking me myself right now, I might just call Shaw's up and just ask him um, during my lunch break uh, in, in next month, if I can just come up there and bag groceries in uniform. Um, I, I think I, that, that sounds actually pretty fun. Oh, we get in your line for sure. <laughs> <laughs> just not with any heavy, heavy things. <laughs> Oh, thank oh, yeah. you. Yeah, I would. Yeah, thank you very much for the for, for for that comment, and and we will find ways to do that. How many officers are actually employed by Montpelier? I don't know. There are seventeen sworn officers, including myself. And so when it's sworn, it, it's just a, you know a, that that they have powers enacted to them by the state. Um, so uh, so I will I try to get out to the streets as much as I can, especially when I become fully certified. It's a longer process within this state that I can actually work on my own. At this point, I have to have somebody riding in the car with me if I'm in uniform. Uh, <laughs> so that's another uh, potential issue. But with the, the state, they're, they're, they're wonderful. Drew Bloom and their team at the Academy are doing an awesome job and, and I'm learning a lot from them. So there are 17 uh, full-time officers. The city of Montpelier doesn't have part-time officers. One of the biggest things, especially uh, explained to me by my predecessor, by, by Tony, was that when you have, unfortunately, sometimes you may have part-time officers that don't have the experience or know the expectations of what it is um, in, in the community like Montpelier with very, very high expectations. And um, so we want to make sure that we have people who are devoted um, full time, who have that time, who have the, who understand the community, who understand the resources here uh, to work. So we don't typically employ part time officers unless they may have been years of experience from this department or going forward. But I don't think that we have many part time officers here. I, I do have one other question, which which I hope I'm not throwing bombs here. But, oh no, please. Uh, <laughs> As, as a long since retired former motorcyclist, he mostly rides bikes now. Uh, what, what is your take on uh, loud mufflers and pipes, which is often a, a late night event uh, down Main Street and out Elm Street, which goes right right by where I live? The, um, uh, yeah, I've heard that there have been some people have it down to the time and i've heard there's one gentleman especially around three o'clock and around seven o'clock in the morning who comes speeding through those areas with a very very loud muffler slash engine on, on on the bike um so my um it's i understand the need for them to be heard but uh <laughs> Because I used to ride myself until I been to too many. Yeah, I used to ride myself, but then I scared myself out of it. But um, no, I, I think that um, in those cases that uh, I'm, I have to look to see if there's a municipal law that 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 has a requirement on sound. Um, but yeah, I think that especially during uh, in 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 high in, in neighborhoods or high density areas, uh, it, it's more of a disturbance or a hindrance. Um, right. Than it right. Is. Yeah, just as you're settling off to sleep, it's boom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then the adrenaline keeps you up for another 30 minutes. And it's like, <laughs> right. oh, oh okay, yeah. Well, thank I, you. I get it. So thank you. Uh, 
Hey, we are coming up at 7.20 right now. Um, are there um, any other uh, questions, comments, complaints, anything else that I can answer? I'm very, very grateful to have this opportunity to speak with everyone. Sounds like my husband would like to say something. Okay. Hi, Chief. Um, I was wondering, could you tell us a little bit of how we are so fortunate to have you here? How did you come to be here? Uh, well, fortunate, give me a few weeks. I, I might, I hope I don't do anything to make you upset, but um, I've had the, um, it's, it's been an extraordinary trip and uh, in coming, I came out from, from New Mexico and, and, and when I was, when I left New Mexico in El Gordo, um, uh, we were looking for, for different positions. And when we saw that Montpelier came up, um, it was kind of like a boom, let's, I got to put in for it. I got to put in for it. And, uh, and one of the reasons is when I was in Chicago and we were working towards the consent decree, um, we were looking at best practices. What are some, some things that other places are doing that Chicago police department can do and implement? And so I, I looked at each different state. And, and when I looked at Vermont up in the East Coast, it's like, oh, Montpelier, that's, that's pretty interesting. Oh, the, the chief was part of the, you know, was, uh, was at the White House talking about 21st century policing. And, and it's like, wow, they, you know, this is kind of unbelievable on paper. And then the opportunity came up and then I applied and, 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 and by graces, I'm here. And, and when I came here, it, it, it's exactly everything that I've read it was. And, um, and I don't, don't give that one out lightly. And it's, um, so yeah, I'm just, it's, it's, it, it enjoys to anyone in the circle who, who researches policing, um, knows that Montpelier is one of the strongest places in the state of Vermont. And, um, and then coming here and talking to all of the other professionals, um, other peers, other investigators, other agencies, it's yeah, it's it's definitely a great place. So, and if I can tell you a weird story about that one too, I screwed up big time. I was uh, I put in for Laguna Beach, California, um, at one, and so as I was working on my um, cover sheet, yeah, I, I I was like, okay, I made the changes, made everything, you know, kept a lot of the information the same, but on the whole thing, I said, you know. Hello, Mr. Bill Frazier to the city council. I would love to serve Laguna Beach as its next police chief. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that's a, that was a job killer, I thought, because I, I, I screwed up and put that on my, on my cover letter. And when they called me and, and asked me to do an interview, um, the first thing out of Bill Frazier's mouth was, so tell me, why do you want to come here to Laguna Beach? And so then it was an uphill battle. For, or it, was a, it was a climb up from there. It's pretty funny. But um, no, I just, uh, I just appreciate this town. I appreciate the people. Um, and, and then again, on part of this other rant, not only is the, the department that I like, but the people here, um, very, very engaged, very, very just involved. And I think that strength, <laughs> I think that strength also brings other opportunities um, in that when we, when there are some things that we're working on to try to improve in our department, we can reach out to the community for help because I, I think there's a lot of voices and, and people who want to help us to get better and to, uh, to get stronger. So I plan on tapping into that and all of us becoming uh, just a huge family. It's a city that loves each other. Well, I think everybody with us tonight appreciates you also. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Well, I didn't say I would be happy to ask questions. I'd be happy to listen to anything you have to say. Oh, okay. Um, well, let's see. I see, well, first, Mr. Mr. Girdle. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, okay, yeah, if, if there's anything that I can do for you, um, by all means, please uh, contact me. Let me know. I'd love to answer any questions that you that you may have. Um, but um, no, I, I um, as far as just uh, I think that in in, in moving back uh, towards I guess policing, I, w I do want to say that um, the state of Vermont um, is geared towards. Um, I think is is defaulted uh, towards having a lot of provisions on law enforcement to make sure that it that it doesn't have
have mission creep that it doesn't overstep its bounds. And, and, I've, and I've gotten to learn that since I've been um, in the academy and seeing the differences in how, what the culture is in law enforcement in this state is compared to other states that I've been to. And I, I think that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a very uh, fortunate place to be in. And um, I just wanna make sure I do my best to contribute to it, to, uh, to keep it going in a positive direction and to keep it stronger. It's, it's, I've met a lot of wonderful people here and I've been told by several others, you know, it's, there's a lot of great people here, but at the same time, uh, remember that, you know, uh, Vermont is, is a sampling of, of everything that's going on in the state. So while I don't um, discount anyone else's experience that may have been negative in the state, especially for people of color, um, mine have been overwhelming, very positive and open. Um, with those with those folks who do um, want to make sure that uh, professionally um, that we make ourselves transparent and we make ourselves accountable and I by all means uh, intend to, to make sure this department remains that way but it's been a very welcoming city and a state and I'm glad to be here if, if I could ask a question that's a little broader than Montpelier You've been all over the country, seen policing all over the country. Are you hopeful for the future? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that um, I think that right now, when when the emotions came out, um, you know, you don't you don't get to see. I want to say this very delicately and sensitive. It's not every day you get to see someone who was violated in the way that and what happened in Minneapolis. Yes. And, and I think that that turned on a light bulb for a lot of people. And, and a lot of emotion came, came out of that. So I think there's two directions we can go with it. We could, we could shut ourselves off and circle the wagons and just wait till it blows over and keep doing the same crap that we've been doing before. Or we as a collective group can be better than what we've seen in the past. And I am extremely optimistic with, with where our societies are going, with where our communities are going, um, and with, especially with where our profession is going. And uh, so I, I, I think policing is going to change for the better. And um, in some cases, it's gonna change very quickly. Other cases, it might take some time, but um, I'm very positive on where we're gonna go. I know we can do this. Oh, so I, I, I should actually, the pronunciation is Gerdell. Gerdell. I, the, the, the girdle I've gotten over since it was only really tough in middle school when I had a teacher who throughout the year never got, got the pronunciation right of Gerdell. But uh, thank you very much. And we'll, we'll definitely be in, be in uh, touch and following things along. So and thank I'm going to check Gerdell. out. <laughs> All right. Take care. Enjoy your night. Okay, bye. And if there's no one else left, I won't keep you any longer. <laughs> oh, it's all good. You you have a good day, sir. You do the same. And thank again, you so much. thank you for coming here. I I really appreciate that you chose Montpelier. I really appreciate they chose me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Take care. Okay. Bye bye. Bye now. If I can figure out how to get off this. Um, uh, that little red button at the bottom right that says in. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I do usually do it on my uh, laptop, not on my wife's phone. Um, so uh, I'll have to bring up. Oh, I think he w left me. No, maybe not. I'll uh, I'll bring it to you, dear. I think he's still there looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> that is a lovely shirt you have. <laughs> All right, let's see what we can do here. Okay, you take Bye. care. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye. It's 7.30. I'll go ahead and sign off, too. Everybody take care. <laughs>